All right, I think that we can get started. Aaron and Hoover, are you guys ready? All right, uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, this is our webinar, Climate Justice and Indigenous Rights at the Legislature in 2024. I'm Kevin Ruther, I'm MCA's uh, Chief Legal Officer and Deputy Director, and today I'm going to moderate our conversation. With me are Juventino Mesa, from uh, Interfaith Power and Light, and then also Aaron Clemps from MCEA. I'm gonna give them an opportunity in just a few minutes to introduce themselves. Um, but first, a little bit about MCEA and what we have planned today. Uh, MCEA, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, uh, is the state's leading legal organization using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment and the health of its people. And this year is our 50th anniversary. Um, this webinar, in fact, is one of a series this year that we're offering to celebrate our anniversary. And of course, we couldn't do our work without you. We certainly wouldn't have made it to 50 um, without all of you. So your support really fuels this work and we thank you for that support. What we have planned today, um, after introductions, I wanna give Juve and Aaron a bit of time to give us the lay of the land up at the legislature. Uh, Juve is running a major campaign called Rise and Repair. We'll hear about that. And Aaron will talk a bit about some of the highlights of the session so far and important dates that are coming up. And then second, we're going to take a deeper dive look at some of the policies that Rise and Repair and MCEA are promoting this session. Um, sort of dive into what the politics are like for some of those policies. Um, we also wanna talk about how you can get involved in the work that we're doing up there. And then finally, we will save some time for your questions and we'll be using the Q&A box. It's in the center of your screen at the bottom you have a question, something comes up uh, while, while we're going, we'll try to get an answer to that. But um, if not, we'll definitely take up as many questions as we can at the end and we'll reserve some time for that. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so with that, I wanna turn it over first to Juve and ask you to introduce yourself, tell, you, tell, tell folks a little bit about yourself, Juve, if you will. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time to be here with us today. My name is Juventino Mesa, and I am a lawyer with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. I am leading our legislative affairs work this session. This is my second year here at MNIPL. <clears throat> our campaign again this year is Rice and Repair, focused on indigenous rights and climate justice. I have been involved in the legislature since I was a high school student trying to pass a bill to recognize undocumented students as residents of Minnesota in order to obtain in a situation. Um, and either fortunately or unfortunately, I have not left legislative affairs uh, since then. I obtained my JD last year from Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. And my focus in school was immigration law and federal Indian law and tribal sovereignty. I'm excited for this opportunity to talk about the work many organizations and people are doing. This legislative session focused on indigenous rights and climate justice. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks so much for being here, uh, Uwe, and congratulations on your graduation from law school. It's a great accomplishment. Um, Aaron, uh, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thanks again for everyone who's tuned in. I love the legislature, and I'm spending a lot of time up there this year. Uh, my name is Aaron Clems. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. I've been with MCA for about seven years now in a variety of roles, mostly at the legislature and in communications work. And um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with Juve and Kevin about the work that we're doing this year. Um, as everyone knows, there was a lot of activity last year. It was really exciting. And it's kind of an interesting vibe up there this year. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about some of the work that we're doing, but also uh, the work that Rising Repair is doing. So thanks to Hubei for joining us today. Great. 
Um, so let's go back to you, Juve, and can you tell us a little bit about the Rise and Repair Coalition? Um, what are your goals with it? Who are the members? Um, yeah. Rise and Repair is a diverse alliance of people and organization advancing indigenous rights and climate justice during this 2024 legislative session. This is our second year. Last year was historic in many ways because the legislature delivered in many community requests, uh, such as cumulative impacts, 100 renewable energy by 2040, MNIPAL, led on passing the Minnesota Green Bank in order to fund the transition equitably. One of our board members at MNIPL describes reparations as building power to give up power. And I think that is the point of rise and repair. Not one organization has the power to do everything they need uh, to get their work done. So we're organizing together to have a bigger impact at the legislature. I see the legislature as a math equation. You need a certain number of votes to pass something. And those votes have to come from all over the state. The goal of Rice and Repair is to organize statewide, a statewide network of people from across Minnesota to support the work organizations are doing at the Capitol. Kevin, do you want me to sort of Keep going, or you want to ask me other yeah. questions? Yeah, no. What, why don't you go ahead and tell us who are who are some of the members of Rise and Repair? Um, how big is your coalition? Yeah, so we continue to add members as time goes by, um, but some of the groups involved, obviously, Mencia, MNIPL, Mikasa, Friends of the Boundary Waters, MN350 Action, RICA, Cure Minnesota, Climate Generation, Vote Solar, um, a bunch of others. There is, I think, 21 or 22 organizations involved uh, right now. However, I would describe uh, Rise and Repair uh, as two categories. Mm -hmm. uh, one category is organizations that, organizations that have a legislative priority, like MNCA, MNIPL, MN350. And then there are organizations or groups of people from congregations and, and individuals who are supporting the work these other organizations are leading on. You can see a list of the organizations on riceandrepair.org slash partners. Ah, great. So with so many groups involved, Juve, how are you um, going about setting priorities or even deciding what it is that the coalition wants to work on? I mean, some of the policies we've identified, we're going to get to them in a little bit, but tell us a little bit about the process that you've used. Yeah, so Rice and Repair uh, as a group um, has been kind of uh, meeting since last fall, um, and we decided on five umbrellas. So every bill that each organization is leading on falls under one of these umbrellas. Uh, reparations and sovereignty, climate goals and truth telling, economic development and just transition, regulatory protection of people, land, air and water, and environmental justice. The nature of the coalition is very organic and each organization informs the group what kind of support they need uh, from the rest of us. For example, yesterday, three different organizations requested other organizations or people sign on to letters of support. Um, I think it was Cure Minnesota, Sierra Club, uh, Sierra Club <laughs> and RICA. Um, and each letter was related to a priority of their, theirs. Um, and so, uh, people can sign on to those letters and through rice and repair we can amplify their request um, we meet every friday morning to talk about what's going on on the uh, legislative priorities what is coming up for the next week um, and identify action items we also have a group of amazing volunteers who are super active and help with action items each organization identifies these volunteers have helped us do phone banks, writing letters, calling constituents in specific districts, 
about specific bills with social media, events, uh, you name it. Um, and then every afternoon, we send out an email to Rice and Repair World uh, with a very long list of items. <laughs> if you are someone who is a keyboard activist, we will give you 20 things every week uh, to take action on. Uh, if you are able to attend meetings in person or make phone calls, we will give you multiple opportunities to get involved in those ways. The nice thing about such uh, a big group of organization working together is that each person individual individually can make a decision about how to get involved. And there is many, many ways to do it, either just by being on your computer or other actions like calling or attending hearings in person. That's great. It sounds like a really important um, organizing effort and like you're really doing a lot of work. Um, tell us, I know that you're going to have a rally day, so I want to hear about that, but I think that um, there may be people online right now who are thinking to themselves, do I want to get involved in that? Uh, how do they reach out to you or what's the best way to plug in individuals who may not be members of your coalition groups, but who want to do some of that volunteer work? Yeah, so you can go to riceandrepair.org um, and we have a involvement uh, sign-up letter or sign up form um, and you can indicate uh, the different ways that you want to get involved. Um, there is also a calendar that you can download um, to your Gmail and um, all of the organizations add events to this calendar um, on an ongoing basis. So you will also uh, have information about what these events are, when they are, what they're about. Um, and also you can sign up for the e-newsletter. Um, and this is the one that we send out every week on Fridays, uh, where you can learn about all of the many updates organizations have and actions that people can take. Great. Um, tell us about the Lobby Day. Yeah. So I'm really excited about Lobby Day. This is uh, the second year that I'm helping organize it. Um, last year we had I think 345 people, now that I was counting. Uh, and I organized uh, meetings with 36 leg legislators. Um, and this year, so on Tuesday next week, uh, February, March 12th, <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, be doing our lobby day, uh, Rice and Repair lobby day. Um, and it's going to be two parts. Uh, there is going to be a morning session um, <clears throat> where people can join us at the Christ on the Hill Church, which is right across the Senate building uh, by the Capitol. Um, and people can come for the morning part. Uh, you will get information about what organizations are working on. You can ask you know, more questions about different different legislative priorities organizations are leading on. Um, and then you will also get a training on how to talk to legislators. Um, and, and then in the afternoon part, uh, we're going to do a rally at the Capitol Rotunda at 2 p.m. Uh, where you're going to hear different speakers representing different organizations um, some legislators are going to attend. Um, and then I have scheduled, uh, as of right now, 42 meetings with uh, 42 legislators. Um, I'm shooting for 50, uh, but don't hold it against me if I don't get to, to that. Um, and those meetings with legislators are going to happen throughout the day. Most of them are going to happen uh, between noon and 4 p.m., um, you can sign up for the rally on uh, riceandrepair.org. Um, and this is a great chance to meet other people, learn about other organizations. Um, but also, uh, you know, we need to call on legislators about the climate crisis and we need to deal with it uh, with urgency. Great. Thanks, Uwe. Um, I want to go to you, Aaron. So I know that we're in the second year of the biennium. Um, big things happened last year, obviously. 
tell us a little bit about what you're seeing the second year and maybe talk a little bit also just about MCEA's legislative work, what you've been doing and seeing up at the legislature. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. And I, we we love the, the legislature because it's so... Huh, it's so it's like its own uni universe. I, I always analogize it to a high school. It kind of feels like there are cliques like there are high school, you know, it, there's all kinds of activities. Um, and we are in what's called a bonding year. Generally speaking, you know, as you know, last year we passed this very large budget um, and you have to pass a, a, a two year budget every two years to keep the government funded and open and operating. Uh, the budget was passed last year. So this year there's no need to pass a new budget and so usually that focus is on what's called the bonding bill or the construction bill, right? So this is money that's being set aside, usually borrowed. The reason why it's called bonding is we, we, we actually issue bonds to pay for it over a longer period of time. And frequently these are construction projects or large ticket items that are longer term investments in the state. And so they tend to be uh, done through this process. It's also a shorter session. We started on February we, start, we started in February um, and we'll end in May. Last year, you may recall, we started right after New Year's Day and went all the way to Memorial Day. So it's about a, a month and a half shorter than the other session, which also puts a lot of time pressure because um, any bills that need to get done this year have to run through the committees by a deadline. I'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, and that deadline is coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, lastly, there's sometimes a supplemental budget, and you may have seen news this week about new projections that there is a surplus on the bottom line right now for Minnesota's budget. Um, but at the same time, there's not a lot of room for investments that are ongoing into the next biennium. And so we expect to see a number of what are called supplemental budget bills, and those are frequently used as vehicles for policy as well. And so advocates like uh, us at MCEA and for the folks in, in Rise and Repair We'll see this as an opportunity to try to get some of our objectives and our bills included in those supplemental budget bills. And um, that news just broke last Thursday, so we still really haven't fully seen what the impact will be at the legislature, but I expect that there will be at least a few committees that we work on that will have their own supplemental budget, and then we will try to get some of our policy initiatives included there. Um, lastly, to your question about um, MCA's priorities, um, some of them we'll talk about as part of the, the, the bills that Rise and Repair is working on, but a couple that I want to highlight that we that we won't talk about elsewhere, a lot of work on water. As you know, our EPA petition for nitrate contamination of wells in southeastern Minnesota has really spurred some quick and dramatic action, both at the legislature and, and in agencies. And we're in a lot of conversations right now about how to fund the response necessary to address the public health crisis in southeastern Minnesota. Um, we're also working on some bills that relate to legal cases that MCA has been involved in. For example, you may recall our Limbo Creek litigation about public waters. There is a little bit of a loose end at the end of that process left behind by the Supreme Court decision, and we're trying to get the legislature to clarify some aspects of public waters definitions to make sure that all public waters in Minnesota are protected, whether or not they're listed on the inventory and map that's kept by the Department of Natural Resources. Otherwise, I think our bigger questions will come back to as part of the discussion of some of the bills that Rise and Repair is working on. But that's okay. kind of an overview of where we're at after the first after the first three weeks of this legislative session. Great. Uh, how about you, Hugo? What what do you see going on at the legislature after the first three weeks of the session? I know that you talked a little bit about how people can get involved in the coalition, but what have you been learning? Yeah. So. <clears throat> I think that this is such a good question and we can go all over the place. <laughs> so I'll try to focus uh, my energy here. Um, for Rise and Repair, um, we have been meeting with community groups since October, 2023. Uh, we have attended meetings with people and groups, congregations uh, and the like in the Twin Cities, Mankato, Duluth, Wayseta, North Minneapolis. We also held meetings with multiple legislators, including Senate President Bobby Joe Champion and House Energy Committee Chair Petty Acom. Um, we are obviously connecting people to, to the legislature. We brought people to the opening day of session um, and dropped off postcards. Uh, we had some folks doing some singing <laughs> at the legislature, which you would uh, be surprised was really effective in capturing people's attention because usually people are just yelling at each other. Um, and so it was really fun and such a, a different way of engaging people and engaging legislators. 
Um, and I think what we have learned by sort of organizing outside session and now that session has started um, is that many are feeling that legislators don't really want to go big this year. Um, I think many in the con in the coalition are concerned that legislators are not treating this climate crisis with urgency. There are a lot of politics at play. Um, and so it is really important that all of us invite our legislators to go bold in addressing our present climate crisis with the urgency it deserves. Great, uh, amen to that. Um, I want to get to the policy ideas that uh, we're going to talk about, but Aaron, you mentioned that there's a deadline looming. Can you talk or explain a little bit about uh, the deadlines and how that works? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, it's it's obviously like from a, from a perspective, if you're not up at the legislature every day, it can kind of feel like things move kind of slowly. But from the perspective of people that are up there every day, things are moving at lightning speed right now. And the reason why is to do with what is called deadline day. And it is kind of an artificial deadline that, that the, the House and the Senate set for themselves, after which, if you want a bill to advance, you need to get a vote of a committee in favor of your bill in both the House and the Senate before March 22nd. So that's only 17 days away, uh, two and a half weeks away. So that really has caused a lot of compression of schedules there. And so for advocates like us at MCEA and at Rise and Repair and MNIPL, if we have a bill that we want to get through the process, we have a really big deadline coming up in the next week and a half. It's part of the reason why I really like how the timing of Rise and Repair's rally days, because this is really when you need to send that message to your legislator that you want them to take action on something for it to get done. Um, there'll be more work to do, of course, but that committee deadline is very important. And it's something that really means that that first six weeks of the legislative session feels like a, a very quick sprint to get to that deadline. And then things kind of slow down a little bit after that. But to folks who are not at the legislature every day, I'm sure you're like, we've got four months. You know, that's plenty of time. Um, but there's also a lot of internal deadlines that the, the body set for themselves. One last thing I'll add here is that these are rules that are created by the leadership of the bodies, but they can always be changed. And so um, I always say that a bill is never fully dead at the legislature. It's only mostly dead, to borrow a line from the Princess Bride. Um, you can always, if you're the if you're the leader of the, the House or the Senate, you can make things happen, even if it doesn't meet deadline. But it is a crucial day to show that you have a viable proposal. And it really is a way for you to show as an advocacy group that you're that your priority is shared by the legislature and by other folks in Minnesota. Thanks. So important deadlines coming up. Um, I want to remind people that we're using the Q&A feature. Uh, you'll see a button at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question, go ahead and put it in there and we'll try to get to as many of those as, as we can. I think we identified about five different policies or bills that um, we are working on here. And so let's jump to those and start with the Ratepayer Protection Act. Can you give us the context and the policy of uh, that's behind this bill? Yeah, so <clears throat> the Red Ratepayer Protection Act is a bill introduced by Representative Greenman and Senator Marty. Uh, it is House File 4292 and Senate File 4426. Um, the act would prevent Minnesota's investor-owned utilities from using ratepayer money against ratepayer interests by spending it on political influence activities and other unjustified costs. So what does this really mean? Well, the bill will close loopholes in existing policies so investor-owned utilities cannot use money from ratepayer bills to lobby regular regulators or lawmakers. In lamest terms, <laughs> what you pay uh, as a energy consumer, uh, for example, I live in West St. Paul, so my company, Excel Energy, uh, what that means is that the Excel Energy cannot use what they're making out of my uh, energy bill to lobby against my own interests. 
Um, the bill also strengthens restrictions on what expenses investor-owned utilities can pass on to ratepayers through electric rates, such as trade organization dues, advertising, even event sponsorships. It creates expanded disclosures and enforcement mechanisms for transparency and compliance. And it sets a reasonable limit on how much utility executive pay can be billed to ratepayers. <clears throat> I can go on and on about it, um, but I will stop there. Um, I will mention that the organizations that are leading on this bill are Community Power, Cooperative Energy Features, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, the Minnesota Environmental Justice Table, MNIPL, Sierra Club, uh, Solar United Neighbors, and Vote Solar. Great. What kind of opposition does does the bill have? Well, it has a lot of opposition, uh, opposition especially from the big energy companies, uh, but also from um, the co-ops, um, because mm -hmm. what um, has been happening, and there is this organization, Cub Minnesota, that is a um, consumer protection uh, organization. Yeah. Um, what we have found and learned is that the increases in executive pay, but also what lobbyists are getting paid, uh, actually a big part of it comes from what we pay to them. And so they're passing on um, their uh, wins or earnings onto us as ratepayers. And so the opp opposition is huge. I mean, think about the many co-ops in the state, Excel Energy, and how many uh, lobbyists they have compared to, you know, five organizations with part-time lobbyists. Yeah. So if I'm a I'm a rate payer, and this is something that really interests me, uh, what do you recommend? How do I get involved? Learn more. About yeah. That? So yeah, yeah. So you can find more information on rice and repair. Um, you can also, um, again, we send updates on this all the time, um, but if you want to really get involved in this, uh, um, send me an email. My email is on the website um, and I can connect you directly to the organizations um, who, who are leading on this and can give you a lot more information uh, to help them um, get get this uh, push, push for it. Cool. And this would be one of the bills that people can lobby about on the lobby day. This would be one of the bills. Um, we will have a handout. Um, we will also have someone talk about it. Um, someone from one of the organizations present on it uh, during the lobby day. So you actually understand what the issue is. And then there'll be a handout as well that you can bring to your legislator. Okay. Um, Aaron, let's talk about the 100% e-waste collection and recycling bill. Yeah, it, it's really well timed because the first hearing for this bill will be held today at 3 p.m. in the Senate Environment Committee. Uh, Senator Kupek from Moorhead is the Senate sponsor of this bill, Representative Hollins from St. Paul, which represents the district of MCEA. No, actually not quite, real close to where MCA World Headquarters is, but in St. Paul. Um, you know, Minnesotans are sitting on a huge stockpile of strategic and critical minerals, and it's not a mountain or a mine, it's your junk drawer. Um, the average American has 80 e-waste devices hanging around their house after they're obsolete or unused. And in Minnesota, there's a huge gap between the amount of electronics that we collect versus what electronics are available for collection and eventually recycling. Um, as you know, MCA has been working on copper nickel mining and other mining issues for a long time. And in this work, um, we really dug hard to see where the alternatives could be to digging up new mines in Minnesota, because there is a need for the materials and metals for the clean energy transition. Um, there's a group called Recycling Electronics for Climate Action that's been formed. Um, Maria Jensen and John Carney are the two principal folks working on that. Um, Maria used to work for a electronics collector, and John used to be the president of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industry Association. So they bring a lot of industry experience to this, this debate. 
and have put together a really comprehensive bill after working all summer and fall with the counties and the solid waste administrators to develop a comprehensive solution for Minnesota's electronic waste problem. Right now we collect about a quarter of our electronics and the rest of it gets landfilled or incinerated. And that's just a huge waste. Um, and so, you know, interestingly enough, the politics of this bill are fascinating because you have supporters, including MCEA and other groups that are working on mining issues. And you also have Mining Minnesota and other mining companies supporting this bill. Um, you know, to, to my view, that's a really good thing and a positive development because it illustrates that everyone recognizes that, this, that it's true that metals that we've already mined should be put to use and not just wasted. Um, and that's probably the best and the fastest way for us to get the materials that we need for this clean energy transition that we're all working very hard toward. So if you're interested in this bill, um, we actually have a hearing today and there's also a hearing tomorrow in the House Environment Committee at 3 p.m. And so first of all, whenever there's a bill like that that you support, showing up to be supportive of it is a really good way to do that. Um, and so if you're interested in that, um, we can put information in the chat. You can also follow up, but basically 3 p.m., in the House tomorrow, 3 p.m. in the Senate today, and there's a chance for you to come out and directly support this bill if you think it's a good idea. Great, thanks. Um, Hubei, I'm gonna go back to you on the, um, the Rate Payer Protection Act because we had a couple of questions, if that's okay. Uh, one is about who would, who would enforce this provision? Would it be done at the PUC? Or, I mean, I guess it would be since the PUC um, reviews rate cases? Do you happen to know? Yeah, it would be the PUC. Okay. And then are um, the investor-owned utilities and the co-ops treated the same, or is there some difference between those two? I think it's treated the same um, in the sense of uh, how do you pass on the costs of, you name it, onto the rate payer? And so a co-op or a, a utility or the other ones um, can uh, function a little differently, but at the end of the day, the, the, the rate payer ends up footing the bill for some of these um, costs that shouldn't go to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Aaron, what are the bill numbers for the e-waste bill? I, I, I'm not as prepared as I should be. I don't know how the number in front of me. Sorry. Okay. We'll give you a chance to try to- I'll look it up. It somehow. Um, yeah, somebody's asking for that. So okay. if we can get it, that'd be great. We can. Let's talk, Hube, about the land back bills and what yeah. that policy is all about. Yeah, so <clears throat> one of the reasons that um, for rights and repair um, to be focused on indigenous rights and climate justice is obviously the uh, indigenous community's uh, relationship to the environment or surrounding um, is uh is is one of being one with your environment, and so the the land uh piece and the sort of environment are all uh together, and so the indigenous groups that we're working with um always uh tell us about you know it's not about uh the uh being in relationship uh with uh the environment but it's rather that you are part of the environment uh and so it's a different um way of, of seeing the world and so land obviously it's it's important in in different ways i mean um we don't have to go into the history of uh taking land from uh tribal community communities um and the recent um rise and repair is uh, focused on this is because we have a strong connection to indigenous folks who are organizing in this work. And so the environment and land back um, is uh, uh, connected, uh, all connected. Um, and so we're, we're taking the lead uh, from these indigenous leaders uh, in this work. Um, last year uh, was historic uh, in another way as well. 
uh, at the legislature because it was the first time in the history of the state of Minnesota where the state government returned land back to a tribal community. The Upper Sioux Agency State Park um, has been, uh, or, or there was a bill last year that uh, gives the land back to the Upper Sioux Reservation. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to remember that this didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, community members made this request for many, many years. Um, and the park, uh, even though it's only two square miles, uh, it includes ruins of a federal complex where officers withheld uh, supplies from the Dakota people that led to starvation and death. So it's a very historic and important um place uh, to many. And so now it has been uh, given back uh, to the Upper Sioux Reservation. Um, this year, uh, importantly, is going to be historic because there is actually multiple bills. Um, and Representative Kozlowski from Duluth has a bill that renegotiates the 1954 Treaty Authority to make sure that the DNR protects the land under the treaty. Um, I think if you look at the history of the DNR um, and many legal issues in the last few years, especially around uh, pipelines, uh, the DNR has fallen short of protecting water. Um, and so uh, Representative Kozlowski is uh, leading this effort to make sure that the DNR's First priority is to protect the land under this treaty. Okay, um, let me just interrupt you quick there and ask for the bill number if you have it. I know that people uh, are really interested in. Yeah, I need to. That has not been introduced yet, oh, okay. um, but I have the bill for the other ones. Got it. Um, and once the bill gets posted uh, or introduced, uh, a number is assigned and uh, it would be posted on the website uh, ricemanrepair.org. Um, Representative Kozlowski has another bill, which is, oh, I need to include the number on the website, um, but it's a bill that uh, returns uh, land from uh, forestry uh, adjacent to the University of Minnesota. And then the Board of Regents are going to kind of coupled together uh, land from the state and from the University of Minnesota and return it back to the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And then Representative Kozlowski and Senator Kunish have another bill that will return the White Earth State Forest land to the White Earth Reservation. And the bill number for that one is House File 4304 and Senate File Three four eight zero, um, and finally, I promise Kevin, um, uh, Representative Becker Finn has a bill. It's not related to land, but it's related to indigenous rights. Uh, House File three four ninety, and it makes it a felony and prohibits selling bones. Um, it applies to all human remains, uh, but of course, uh, in the black market, indigenous and Black remains are the ones often considered collectible. Um, these bills uh, give us all a great opportunity for indigenous-led truth-telling and political solidarity. And they're all listed in the website. And once a bill is a bill number is assigned to them, um, I'll make sure that it's included in the website. Wow, that's um, really interesting, Jose. And good, important work that you all are doing. What, I mean, are these, um, like particularly the land transfer bills, is there opposition to those or are they just going to kind of sail through? What's the politics of, of this? Yeah, so I think that the, the bill that uh, prohibits selling bones um, has pretty broad support. I think the land back bills, um, have an interesting wrinkle in terms of politics um, and that the opposition has really been about why the bills don't dictate that the reservation has to do ABC with the land. For mm -hmm. example, the opposition on the 
white earth land back bill um mm -hmm. uh people are saying why is the why does the bill not tell the wider reservation that they have to allow non-reservation members to uh go to the land <laughs> to the park um you know obviously the issue with any of that is that uh tribal communities are sovereign nations, right? And so uh, a foreign government is not going to tell a sovereign nation what to do with its land. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of uh, what people are missing here is that tribal communities are sovereign and uh, the state of Minnesota, we don't tell them what to do. Interesting, okay. Um, Aaron, we have on the list permitting reform. Yeah. Well, before I talk about that, I want to add one quick thing about the okay. Upper Sioux Agency State Park. Yeah. Um, we at MCA, we worked with the Upper Sioux community on a drainage project that was proposed that would have, that it would impact the land base of the Upper Sioux community. I think a lot of Minnesotans don't know because we're associate we associate um, with a lot of like the northern Ojibwe reservations that are that are at least pretty big in terms of land area. Um, because of the 1862 war and the, and subsequently the land was removed from the Sioux communities that are remaining in Minnesota, the Lakota communities that are remaining. And so many of these communities, including in the Upper Sioux community, have a very, very small land base. And so the conveyance of the Upper Sioux um, uh, Agency State Park back to its original owners is going to have a huge impact on the land base of that community in ways that's really profound. And so you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but in this case, it's a it has a huge impact because of the history of of the conflict between um, the settlers and 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 the and the folks who lived here first. So, yeah. um, I just wanted to make sure I said that. Um, Thanks for that explanation. Um, permitting um, reform. Sorry, uh, you mentioned permitting that. reform. Let's do permitting reform, which always, you know, as an MCA lawyer, makes you a little bit nervous, but yeah, that could be I'm, good permitting reform too. So tell us about it. Sure. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of, when, when people say the words permitting reform, it really depends on who they are and what they mean, right? And the context of this conversation and, where, and how it involves MCEA is that there was a lot of concern that we're not building out the solar, wind, and transmission infrastructure, that we need to make the clean energy transition fast enough. And there was a working group put together where a lot of the folks who work at the Public Utilities Commission, including our lead regulatory attorney and climate director, Amelia Voss, was involved in this conversation about what can we do to try to streamline this process to have it happen faster while not sacrificing citizen involvement and input um, and ensuring that the environment is protected. And so um, there is, there, there is this bill has not been introduced yet, to be clear, but we expect there to be a bill that will be introduced that will contain about uh, 10 things that will be done to kind of make this process move a little bit quicker. Um, and MCEA is going to support that bill. Um, where we won't be supportive is if it does anything that removes protections for other more environmentally damaging things like pipelines, mines, and industrial developments, um, and would short circuit any of the environmental laws that we rely upon at MCEA to protect Minnesota's people and the health of its people from the risks of that. Um, and so MCEA is really engaged on this question. It's a really important climate justice question because for us, we, need, we do need to make this climate transition very quickly. We're, we're well behind where we need to be on that. And so we're really conscious of the fact that our role is to ensure that that happens as quickly as possible while not sacrificing citizen input and involvement and not sacrificing environmental protection. And so that's what we'll be working on over the next few months at the legislature once that bill is introduced is ensuring that other bad stuff doesn't get attached to it um, and become a vehicle for other things that would be more damaging to the environment or the health of Minnesotans. So bill not introduced yet, but what do you think about um, the politics of it and the ability to keep bad stuff off of it? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Uh, you, you've probably seen editorials from folks at the Chamber of Commerce and elsewhere decrying Minnesota's permitting as being terrible or making it impossible to build things in Minnesota. And we don't see it that way at all. I mean, in, in fact, what we see is environmental laws doing their job of protecting Minnesotans from environmentally damaging proposals. 
Um, a lot of the work that we've done, for example, on the polymint mine proposal is based in our environmental laws. And it's ironic to see opponents try to use examples like that to illustrate that there's a problem with permitting, when the truth is that permits were issued for that proposal, and then they were removed by court action that said that they didn't protect the environment and live up to Minnesota standards. And so I think there is always a risk when you have these conversations of every industry that wants to get a free pass from environmental law coming to the table and claiming that this is the time to remove things that would restrain them from doing things that we think would do harm to Minnesotans. So we'll be vigilant and on the case, and that's pretty that's one of our key roles at the legislature is playing that watchdog role and ensuring that what gets done is good for the environment and good for Minnesotans and good for citizen involvement and doesn't cut people out of the process or do harm to them. Oh, okay. The last one we have on our list, Juve, is the Sustainable Investment Act. Uh, what is that about? Why is Verizon Repair um, promoting that? Yeah, so I this is a really complicated one, so I'm going to try to be very slow and clear <laughs> on this bill. And so I hope that uh, I'm able to explain it uh, to folks. Uh, but MNIPL is working with the Sunrise Project on the Sustainable Investment Act. Um, before I go any further, um, I think it's important to for people to understand what ESGs are uh, so that you can understand the rest of what I'm going to say. Um, I'm sure some people are experts in investments. Uh, I am not, and so I had to, to learn this myself. But... ESGs are environmental, social, and governance investing. There, there is the ESG part. Um, ESGs uh, is used to screen investments based on corporate policies and to encourage companies to act responsibly. So that's sort of the ESG part, the term we need to understand to, uh, in order to understand the, the bill itself. Um, <clears throat> So as the public becomes increasingly alarmed about climate change and aware of the role of fossil fuels as the driver for that change, the fossil fuel industry is looking for more ways to rig the rules of the game in its favor. One strategy they are using is to eliminate a state's ability to consider environmental and sustainability factors when investing in pension funds. The fossil fuel industry and allied interests have now passed 22 laws and six resolutions in 14 states that prevent state boards of investments from considering risks of climate change and other ESG criteria. There were five bills introduced in Minnesota that would codify these anti-ESG uh, criteria and 167 bills were proposed in 37 states in 2023. Um, what we understand of these bills is that they raise costs for municipalities and threaten the returns for retirees uh, everywhere they have passed. Um, one example is Texas, uh, where uh, they pass an anti-ESG bill and it's costing uh, those uh, retirees $416 million per year. Um, in Florida, they also passed a uh, an anti-ESG law um, that goes not just banning the state board from investing in ESG, but <clears throat> also not investing in corporations that have made commitments to reduce their carbon footprint or have diversity goals. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to address here. Obviously, we want to enable the state board to consider ESG, uh, ESGs uh, in their investment um, portfolio, uh, but we're not trying to dictate the, the state board that this is what they must do and this is only what they can do. We just want the criteria to be included as part of their assessment in investments. Um, Senator Pappas and Representative Cha are going to be the authors. Um, we just got the bill from the revisor's office and so it should be introduced uh, pre pretty soon. This is uh, a bill that I think it's, 
is going to be hard to pass because the Commission on Pensions and Retirement doesn't really like to do a lot with uh, the the law around pensions. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think we have to push them to pass something because if we lose, and this is what's happened in other states, is if we lose the House uh, this year, or if we lose a constitutional office uh, in Minnesota, uh, the fossil fuel industry is going to come and do do it their way instead of our way. And so we think that enabling the board to consider ESGs is important. Um, and we don't want um, <clears throat> sort of right wing attacks on ESGs to ban even considering uh, these investments. OK, great. Thanks for that explanation. Um, we have a couple of questions that go into different policy areas that I want to get to. I want to invite others to go ahead and put your questions, if you have any, into the Q&A. Um, and then I just, before we move on, wanted to note a comment that we got from Amanda Wold. Thanks, Amanda, for putting this in the, the chat. Um, and she notes, well, Amanda's worked with the Upper Sioux community for a number of years. Um, and we worked with her uh, back during what Erin was describing. Um, she noted, I'm just going to read this, that as a quick reminder, that the Upper Sioux and all Dakota communities in Minnesota don't go by Sioux, but all four Dakota communities prefer to be referred to as Dakota. So a good reminder for us and for all of us, thank you for sharing that. Um, so other things that people were interested in that really aren't on our list, but um, we could address. One is Prove It First, Aaron. I know that you know everything there is to know about Prove It First. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what what that policy is, um, what happened with the hearing. Yeah. Um, so there was a there was a rally in the very first, it was actually on Valentine's Day. So they delivered a nice Valentine um, about how much folks love the Boundary Waters to uh, the governor's office. And there was a really nicely attended and really, especially with a lot of legislators speaking at the Rotunda rally um, and really amazing speeches about the importance of addressing the issue of copper nickel mining and the threat that it poses to water and communities in Minnesota. Um, Prove it first is a bill that would require that before the, a permit could be issued for a copper nickel mine, that they would have to show an example of a mine elsewhere in a similar climate that, that opened for 10 years, operated for 10 years, closed for 10 years, and didn't cause pollution. And basically, it's kind of an invitation to the in industry to prove that there's that, that they we have the high standards and that they can do this without polluting water, which we are not aware of an example so far of any mine of this type that's been avoided in water pollution. Um, this bill has a lot of co-sponsors. I think there's almost 40 of them in the House. Um, and I know that the Senate version has multiple um, clone bills, so you can sign on more people. You can only have five authors in the Senate bill. Um, but that hearing that they were hoping to have uh, and an informational hearing about the bill um, wasn't allowed to happen. And so they did they did their own kind of people's hearing where they had a couple of retired legislators, uh, Steve Sandell, who we worked with on some other stuff before, and Connie Bernardi, who was, used to be my state rep. Um, they did a great job of chairing a committee with lots of international mining experts and local residents that want to testify on this bill. So we're hoping that this comes up again at the legislature this year. There hasn't been a hearing on copper nickel mining in Minnesota at the legislature since 2014. And I just want to stress how odd that is, that for 10 years, an issue that is this controversial and this consequential has not had a hearing of any sort at the legislature. And that needs to change. Uh, I'm hopeful that this has been a, a chance for that to change. And I think the Prove It First rally and, and, and people's hearing was a good example of how, how important it is we have this conversation. So I welcome the question. Um, I'm not sure what the prospects for Prove It First are going forward. I know that the organizers on that are really focused on turning people out for um, Senate district conventions and BPOU conventions to advance a resolution supporting the Prove It First uh, campaign. So I would recommend folks go to the Friends of the Boundary Waters website to check that out. There. Really quickly, Aaron, I'm going to cut you off and ask you to give 30 seconds on uh, the smart salting bill. Oh, is that is that in the hopper? Where is that? It's, it's a little bit unclear right now. The smart salting bill um, 
has a couple of different versions that are floating around. I know that there are some disputes about the level of liability protection, and that has been ongoing for a while now. Um, I got some email this morning about the possibility of this moving forward. I know that the Metro watershed districts are really engaged. I'm not sure what the prospects are, but um, there is something going on with that. I'm just not sure what the prospects are right now. Uwe, you started us out saying that, um, you know, the climate crisis requires bold action. What can people do to, to get legislators to take the bold action that you think is required? Yeah, I think, um, I think we often think that the, that, that people don't really have a say on what happens during session because things are a done deal. And I think that's not true. I think um, legislators oftentimes don't hear enough from their constituents about specific issues. And so I would encourage all of you to reach out to your legislator um, and tell them about uh, one thing or many things. You know, it would be best if you write to them separately so that they focused on each issue. Um, but we really need people to reach out to their legislator um, and then chairs of committees to give us hearings on all of all of these bills. Um, I think that's kind of the challenge that we're facing right now is that because we have a short session um, and because uh, people are worried about the election this fall, that we, uh, um, you know, we're not going to do all this uh, bold and progressive uh, work. And so, and I think that's a mistake, but, you know, if legislators are not hearing from people, um, they're not going to pay attention, right? A legislator is a human being who cannot pay attention to everything that is introduced. And that's why it's really important that all of us are talking to them, whether that's calling, emailing, uh, going to the Capitol in person, stopping by to their office, drop a note. Uh, it really makes a difference. And, and it would make a difference in all of this work that we're doing collectively. Yeah. Okay. I, I just have one quick thing that is, if you're a constituent of a legislator, they want to hear from you and you should go to their, their office and, you know, they're going to, they'll go out of their way to talk to you. So always start with your legislator, even if they're not a, you know, a political party that you support, whatever it is, their job is to represent you. And I would always recommend people start there because I feel like that's under, underutilized and folks sometimes think that no one wants to hear from them. No, they want to know, they want to hear from you. Great. We're going to have to end on that note, but before people sign off, just a couple of quick things. I want to remind you that MCA is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. It's a big deal for us. Um, you know, we're doing things like this webinar. We have other webinars that you'll hear about. We have in-person events. So um, please join us in celebrating this uh, big milestone. Um, also, I want to remind you that we can't do this work without you. Uh, we rely on your support. If you're able to make a donation, we certainly would appreciate it. And we want to ask you to support our uh, partner organizations um, to give to you know, the organization that Hube works for and others who are in coalition with us. Um, thank you guys, Aaron and Hube, for all the information and for being here today. It was a great conversation. Uh, and then lastly, don't forget about the Lobby Day, March 12th. We'll hope to see you all out, or some of you at least, out at the Capitol. Um, thanks for being here and for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.